Do you ever wonder how successful entrepreneurs built their businesses from scratch? Are you unsure if starting a business is for you? Well, tune in as we discuss how successful entrepreneurs transformed their ideas into reality. Welcome back to From Zero to Revenue with your host, Chris Yap. Welcome back. You are listening to the podcast show From Zero to Revenue, the show that features the journey of successful entrepreneurs from around the world. I'm your host, Chris Yap. Today, we will discuss how you can expand your business globally, quickly, and effectively. Learn how to dominate the global marketplace with ease and peace of mind. I'd like to thank our sponsor, GapTech Global, your outsourcing company for recruitment, virtual assistance, and various back office services. You can learn more about their services at www.gaptechglobal.com. I am extremely excited to introduce our guest today, a global super connector, a very good friend of mine, the CEO and founder of Global Chamber, Mr. Doug Brunke. Welcome to the show, Doug. Global super connector. I, I like the kind of the feel and the vibe of that. Yes, definitely sir. global. I'm not sure about the super. Definitely <laughs> a connector. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, you are very welcome. Um, I've been... I've been really looking forward to this day where we could actually have you in the show. Uh, I've had several audience kind of ask, because obviously with my business being global, typical questions I, I, I get is like, how do you get, how do you actually expand globally? And as you know, I've introduced few people to the organization, to your organization, and you've helped them in such a immense way. But Doug, you know, 15 years of friendship, and I've seen you kind of really start the tribe, as we call it, from zero and now present in over 520 metro cities uh, worldwide. Man, that blows my mind. And tell us a little bit about Global Chamber. So yeah, the dream was, you know, how can we get a tribe of people around the world that are doing global business to help grow more? Um, Right. Certainly one of the issues has always been, you know, connecting to the right people, clients and resources is, is, is a failure point. It's, it's mm-hmm. how people don't succeed. And so I wanted to build the tribe because mm-hmm. those of us that are doing international business, we're one in a hundred. Uh, there's only less than 1% of U.S. companies export. So that means one in a hundred really care about the world, really, is kind of one wow. way to look at it. That's right. And so when those of us that are involved with international look at the world, we we kind of sort out a lot of that other local stuff and we see the world, we see the opportunity. And so I thought there was a way that we could kind of pull all this together. And I'll give you an example of how that works is today mm-hmm. we did a global chamber. We were doing five events. So we have one more left. We have a virtual dining event later today, a, a Brazilian meal. <laughs> a couple of meetings ago was a partner of ours, IE University in Madrid. They pulled together uh, two women and we brought one woman. It's, it was about women in global business, one of the things that we really care about. And one of them is a lady who is works at Google at Madrid. And so uh, I had never met her before, but she moderated brilliantly. It was great. And so so after it was over, we all kind of popped on the, the video and they introduced me, the, this, this guy with Global Chamber. And she and I were like, wow, you know, first of all, I'm saying to her, like, you're amazing. That was fantastic. And then right. afterwards, she wasn't telling me she was, I was amazing. She was mainly just connecting to me. And then in, later in LinkedIn and some messages she sent to me, it was clear that there's a bond between the Globies. There's there's an understanding that we are different and that we view the world differently. And the power of that is amazing. So, yes, thank you for realizing that, Chris. Thank you for being part of the Global Tribe. And thank you for so many years of friendship. I really do appreciate it. No, absolutely. I love it. Uh, you know, it's like, again, every time I meet someone or just within my network who are at least trying to go global, I make the introduction, you know, Tony is a perfect example. And Tony was a guest here as well some time ago. And 
I know we, he, <laughs> we we hit you up on so many different things. I know you help us get suppliers from Malaysia <laughs> and get connected. I mean, but uh, it's it's just amazing how because you know when you think of global, it's it's so intimidating, right? But I think what you've done, what your chamber have done, it just made it easy. And I think most importantly, it you know it gives them that feeling of security and peace. Because, you know, you're based here in the U.S., but you've got branches worldwide. And, you know, it, it just kind of, it just makes it easier for them. But, Doug, before I dive more into, or do we dive more into the, the chamber, global chamber, tell us a little bit about your background uh, on the personal side, professional background before you actually, you know, decided to get into this entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, that entrepreneurial journey uh, really mostly started with 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 Global Chamber. Uh, my uh, my grandfather, um, who at fifty years old had been a machinist uh, at a in New York City, uh, was believing that he'd be a partner with the company he was with. He at lunch mm-hmm. overheard the boss say, "Joe, he's not going to be you know a partner." He told that to somebody. Oh, my yeah. my grandfather <laughs> Joe heard that. Mm-hmm. So he packed up his lunch, picked up his clothes. He went home to my grandma, Emma, and said, Emma, we're in business. So they started a business at 50 years old. My mother was 13. My uncle was eight. And my my grandmother was crying for days telling Joe to go back to work. This is a crazy thing. And so mm-hmm. that whole experience, including, by the way, his great success with he built a machine shop. He was the go-to person in all of New York City for anything really challenging. If he ever had an engine problem, motor parts, anything like that, my grandfather was the guy to go to and, you know, very successful. So that was my kind of inspiration that at any age you can do that. And wow. so, so growing up in New York, living an international life where I lived in Japan and in Singapore, loved international business. I was ripe to start my own business after I early retired from the DuPont company, a huge, big company. Um, and here it is. You know, the idea came to me. Uh, it seemed like a good idea to simplify the international business process for more than for entrepreneurs and, biz- and businesses. And so that's what we started six years ago. And it's the vision was a little bit uh, un, hard to understand this mm-hmm. virtual world of connections across borders, but COVID-19 honestly has helped facilitate people understanding that, gee, I can do business across metros without actually meeting the person. That's really helped us kind of get to the next level, and we've been growing like gangbusters for the last nine months. So that's that's a little bit of the story. Uh Hopefully that answers some of the questions. No, absolutely. Because, you know, my, my purpose like for this show, um, that's why I the title is From Zero to Revenue, right? Like you're a perfect example. You had this idea. It, you had this vision. You grew it from zero to revenue. And it's just one of the most amazing feelings that you can get, right? It's like you created it yourself. Like when you started this, it was a vision. And I've seen you started it uh, and, again, grew it to the size that you are today. But Doug, you mentioned your grandfather being an inspiration. So obviously you've seen that journey. I'm sure there are struggles there. As an entrepreneur, there will always be those high highs and lows. When you were a kid, did you envision yourself actually being a business owner as well, being an entrepreneur? No, I had no no vision of that. And I went to college really not totally knowing what to do, except I wanted the hardest degree. So I ended up becoming a chemical engineer and I felt that that was marketable. And I also was involved with sustainability and environmental interest. And I wanted to improve the environmental nature of the world. In, in aggregate. And so I, you know, that's how I became a chemical engineer. I be, I worked for the DuPont company. So totally not entrepreneurial, right? right. Um, but, but it gave great experience. And usually when I talk to students and younger people, I, I do advise that, you know, you know, working for a big company actually is not a bad path that's true. As you're growing up because there's training opportunities. There's all sorts of experiences you can get through that. And in my case, it worked out really well because I got to live overseas and I start, you know, I didn't even know like five years into my career 
that international was the thing until the head of Teflon for Asia retired and nobody wanted his job. And I was a 27-year-old kid and it was like, gee, I, I could do that. I, I, I'd love to do that. That would be amazing. And you know, nobody else took it. They argued. My boss was a Hispanic woman and her boss was an African-American guy. And I think probably they thought, you know, gee, you know, I've had a tough time here. And now they're trying to discriminate against this guy because he's too young. Uh-huh. You know, maybe we give him a shot. And he seems right. to be a hard worker and certainly cares a lot about stuff. And so they gave me that position and it turned it into an expat assignment in Tokyo, later an expat assignment in Singapore. No turning back. I was Mr. Global from then on. Wow, that is just, uh, I didn't even know that part of the story, Doug, so that, considering I've known you for 15 years. So that's that's pretty amazing. Um, so, Doug, what was like your aha moment? I know you mentioned, that I, you know, I know your story of the Global Chamber. You mentioned some of it a little bit, but what was your aha moment where, okay, I'm going to build my own chamber and address these problems I'm seeing. What, what was that aha moment? So every entrepreneur has that, right? Where it, right. They, you, you, you probably have like things in your head about ideas. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, this is, this is it. So mine was a wine and cheese event in Carlsbad, California that I drove to from Scottsdale. And I wanted to meet all of the international people through the World Trade Center San Diego, which I was a member of at the time, for some other things I was doing. And it was long drive, as you know. You Have you done that Route 8 probably to San Diego? Oh, yeah. Once? Yep. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's you know, driving across the desert that long straight away, a lot of time to think. But, you know, it's just a long time. So it kind of tired, showed up, bad wine, bad cheese, not very <laughs> interesting people. It was just mm-hmm. like, what in the world? This is like the worst way to meet people. Right. You know, it's like, why? There's got to be a better way. So mm-hmm. I, the next day, my my uncle in San Diego, I got to meet with him. And I think I did some business meetings. But on my drive back, I said, there's got to be some way of connecting to people in a much better way than this. And why not? What if there was a chamber that like was everywhere? Then like from Phoenix to San Diego to Tokyo to Paris to everywhere, Mm -hmm. if there were local people that were well connected, we could connect that and then we could share the trusted network and that would facilitate global business. And so so that was kind of the beginning of it. And the last straw was the World Trade Center. Strange coincidence, but a marketing guy I knew in Scottsdale happened to be doing the World Trade Center website in Scottsdale. They're based in New York, but they were doing it in Scottsdale. And I happened to know him and he said, Hey, I just, I'm working with the CEO of the World Trade Center and he just got fired. Hmm. So you should talk to him because I thought, gee, the World Trade Center should be able to do this. It's just like, why aren't they? Hmm. So he told me basically, look, you know, they're a, they're a real estate company. They build buildings. They put their name on a building. The trade is secondary. Mm-hmm. They'll never do trade as a primary. Mm-hmm. There's an opportunity. So I thought, okay, that's the last thing. I'm going to build this, do this crazy idea. And so off we went. Crazy, crazy idea going forward, which took a couple of years for traction. But the next uh, several years worked out very, very well. And the last nine months have been gangbusters. Wow. That is an amazing story. Again, you know, from idea, it's it's. Don't you feel so powerful, Doug, that you were able to convert that idea into reality and so see the success you have now? <laughs> here's the thing, and you can relate to this, Chris. There's two kinds of people in the world. There's the people who can kind of like piece that together, even though it doesn't exist. And then there's the people that have to have it in their hand yeah. or it doesn't exist. And so my grandfather was... The, the dreamer. And my grandmother, she ended up being the bookkeeper at the business. She was the one that needed it in her hand. So when my grandfather explained to her, here's what it is, we're going to be able to, she said, Joe, that's not practical. You know, go back to work. So my wife is the Emma for me. <laughs> so my wife for the first four years of Global Chamber said, this is the craziest idea. I, I don't know what you're doing. Why are you doing this? And then uh, it was about two years ago, we had a good run, lots of you know, new business and members. And so she came to me one day and said, you know, 
this global chamber thing, it's a good idea. <laughs> it took her four years. Four years. <laughs> four years of my craziness to tell her it's going to be big. And she yeah. never believed it until two years ago. And now, you know, now, now she really kind of understands. Yeah, that's all. We, we definitely have a similar ride because, you know, with, <laughs> with, you, you've seen, you've also seen how Gaptic Global evolved. It was Gaptic, just Gaptic then and then it, you know, became Gaptic Global. Um, my wife, the same. The, the first few years, she thought I was crazy. <laughs> Get a job, right? That's, that's a typical uh, mentality. But fortunately, and I'm sure you are too, we have very supportive wife, family, and I think that's that's it's very it's critical to our success. I'm sure you could relate to that, Doug. But with me, I mean, that's why I'm still doing because I have the wife I have right now. So what a ride, right? <laughs> It, it's it's a ride, but I think I run into that, and you probably do too. And you're 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 another example of it, where the entrepreneur is the dreamer, and you can mm -hmm. see it, right? You mm -hmm. you can you you, and the thing about Global Chamber is, and I've told people this, is that if I was living in New York, where I'm from, or living in Los Angeles, I probably never would have thought of it because you're kind of surrounded by all these global things, and it's like, mm -hmm. who needs another chamber, you know? But there I was stuck in. Phoenix, you know, is like the least global place you could be, you know, I'm exaggerating for, for the effect mm -hmm. to say, you know, gee, what if here we are in Phoenix, we could be connected to the world. So it really, that was another key part of the dream, if you will, for me. And I could see it as clear as day, yeah. you know, my wife could not. And it sounds like your wife, probably you've had some conversations like <laughs> I've had, like, Right. Believe me, where it's going to work. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, the thing about the, your your organization is that, you know, your mission is very clear. Right? In your mission, you know, it says there to accelerate cross-border trade and investment worldwide. Tell us a little bit more about, like, what were you thinking at that moment when you came up with that mission? It's, it's very clear, but, you know, just for the sake of our audience, kind of just appreciate the chamber more. Well, it, it goes back to what I said earlier, the 1% exporting that most people don't get involved in international. And the reason they don't is that it's complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, that you've got culture, you've got different logistics issues, you've got different legal issues. So how do we make, you use the word simpler, mm -hmm. make it simpler. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. And make it, because it's not going to be simple but we need to make it simpler and we need to make it more comfortable for people. A lot of people, when they think about other cultures, they immediately it's like, oh my God, you know, like, wow, that's so foreign. <laughs> to you and I, it's like, wow, that's foreign. That's great. You know, it's so how do we exciting. Get, yeah, no, then that's the typical global tribe, but there are plenty of business people that may not necessarily really, that's their starting point, but they want to grow. 85% of the business in the world in the next five years is outside the U.S. So if you're a U.S. company and you're thinking, you know, gee, I'm happy, you know, with 15% of the world's business, okay, that's fine and that can work, but why not tap into the 85%? And so how do we make it digestible, comfortable, easier for those people? So that's really kind of where we are. And it's turned into, and I started to use this word just in the last week, that we're insanely passionate. The word insane. Right. Several of our people, have, several of the members have said, you guys are like so responsive and you're so like always there. And you're okay. like, if we like, there's never like an email that comes in and we wait a week, you know, it's, it's, it's hot. You know, somebody yeah. has a need, so we handle it. I've started to use that word insane. And to mm -hmm. some extent, you know, I don't understand why more people aren't that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be responsive in the world and you have to move forward and you have to be amenable to situations. And that's part of all part of the world and, 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 and uh, being successful in the world. And we're trying to bring that. Certainly the Globies already understand you have to be that way. The second is for the people who aren't global yet, getting them to understand that that's the response they need to have to be successful internationally. And so that's part of kind of what we're imparting, hopefully, on uh, being successful. 
uh, in the world. And we want more people to be that uh, successful because when there is more success and more trade, there's better understanding between people. And suddenly you start to realize like, okay, well, those people with different skin color and different religions, and they have a different clothing and different food, all of that is superficial. Basically, we all want to just be successful and give our kids a better life and mm -hmm. have a good education and have freedom to be whatever we want to be. Those are fundamental human values. And when you cut through all of that other stuff, that's what we really want. And so the kumbaya behind Global Chamber is, you know, Let's make it a better world. And I, I do fundamentally believe that more business creates that better world. Well, Doug, your, your passion is so contagious. And, you know, actually, I'm getting goosebumps right now because uh, <laughs> everything you said, I've already experienced. That's exactly the reason why, you know, when Tony have this idea, what it involves in international, he'd call me and ask me to call you <laughs> <laughs> and say, hey, Chris, what do you think of this? Let's, let's talk to Doug. And so it's, it's because you're so responsive. It's like, I, I don't remember any email I've sent to you that had more than same day response. And I understand how busy you are, but it's just uh, incredible. But Doug, tell, tell me a little bit about like what, what are the type of companies that you, you feel and who are benefiting greatly from uh, the global tribe? I appreciate it. By the way, that piece is from my grandfather. So the reason why hmm. he was successful was many times he would be, my grandmother would say he'd be at work at five in the morning trying to figure something out. You know, he would, he would never rest. And a lot of what he imparted in me was the, the, the making a difference, the oh, solving problems, you know, helping people out. And that's a great formula, right, for any yeah, business, right, is, is find ways to solve problems and take things to passionately care about your, your, your customers, your clients, and in our case, our members. And so fortunately, we have a team that's, that's built that way. And so most of the people that we end up helping are companies that are, that are, so I'd say smaller and the few hundred millions of dollars, you know, say, say one or two million up to a few hundred million. That's kind of our sweet spot. But there are people who are starting out that we help. There are people that are basic entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs. And then there's, there are big companies. So I was just got on the, I was on the phone. And part of the reason why I kind of zoned out is there's a very large Japanese company that has their U.S. operations in Cincinnati, it's Cow K A O. They do women's cosmetics, and we were talking through like they're they've spent a lot of money with Global Chamber. We want to make sure that we give we're giving them what they need, and so they are a multi billion dollar company, and they've been somewhat kind of standoffish. We haven't been able to engage them in anything, so we've been talking with our local person there in Ohio. Like, you know, what do they need? You know, let's make sure that, you know, we don't go a whole year and say, you know, gee, you know, we had all this stuff for you, all this magic, and we weren't able to provide anything for you. So we're kind of, we were using the word being a little bit of a pest back to them to say, look, you know, there's all this stuff we can help you with, you know, let us help, right. you know, we can, we can lead the horse to water, but, you know, we really need you to drink, but let's, let's have that conversation all along the way. So we are sometimes a pest, you know, mm -hmm. to our members in a hopefully a respectful way. And so really anybody that's involved with from small to, to large are parts of the global tribe and every market segment from cannabis to manufacturing to services of every kind, to energy, to, to government people are members. It's just really a, a, a full spectrum of people who just say, look, you know, we're, we're not happy and just interested with just the local community. We recognize there's needs uh, for what we provide in other cities in, across the U.S. or in whatever country I am in, and also uh, possibly as well across the border. Yes, I, I know that the the members you have was obviously have attended a few events. It's really across the board. Um, there's no specific verticals. It's pretty much anybody who wants to, not just to do business, but at least get kind of educated how it works. They, I mean, this is a great resource. Absolutely. Um, 
I think it's a strength and a weakness in the sense that we're involved with every market segment. I would say where it sometimes falls apart is with somebody who has a very unique niche. Let's say it's in manufacturing, but but I, I we can always help. We really can. And one of them we were helping through something we do in Export League, where we were connecting virtually people to prospects around the world. There was it's actually a Phoenix-based company that does model paint. So, you know, like models that you build, like, um, let's say from World War II planes and boats and things like that, the actual color of those, they do. They do those paints for the modelers. And so that's a pretty esoteric, you know, product, (laughs) right? So, and, and when you're selling in that around the world, you have to know a very specific person, but we were able to help him too. So, so after we were helping him, it was like, okay, we can pretty much help anybody, you know? So that's kind of cool. And it's very uh, kind of reassuring for kind of the overall business model. Normally there's lots of people we can help, but sometimes we run into a very niche player like that. Right. No, sure. Sure. I get it. So Doug, you mentioned earlier that uh, in the last nine months, you've been kind of going gangbusters. So how, how did this pandemic kind of affect uh, the, the chamber's growth? So that's, I mean, when I say nine months, I probably should have done the calculation. It was really about May. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the pandemic really started hitting in March and April. Yeah. So we had right. two pretty slow months. And then May started the uptick again. Mm-hmm. So we've been growing quite rapidly over our uh, first five years. But this then it really started to take off. And even the last few months now have been even more, more crazy. The vision of always being able to do business more effectively so that you wouldn't have to go to Carlsbad and bad have bad wine and cheese and do <laughs> you know go to like a big chamber event where you're sorting through 500 people to find the needle in a haystack that to me always was inefficient so the understanding the members and what they need and then having a big network of people to introduce them to that's always been the dream but everybody wants to like meet people like forever, like, oh, let's have a cup of coffee. It's like, God, why? Why do I need to have a cup of coffee? If Chris, you and I know each other and you introduce me to Tony, you know, and you trust Tony, why can't I trust Tony? That's like a logical thing. We can do business. I think I've met Tony, but why do I need to meet him? I don't need to, you know, we can do that. And that's, that's what changed with COVID is that people started to realize by necessity, they can do business. Now they want to do business with someone that they trust, right? right. That's going to pay their bills. They want a resource that can help them. Mm-hmm. Suddenly now our business model that really hadn't been built around the pandemic, but actually works amazingly well in a pandemic suddenly becomes like a no brainer. It's like, oh, wow. Okay, let's do it. So that's why the last nine months have been amazing and why the last few months have been extraordinary. So I actually agree with you. Um, our, my business, I mean, I know with a lot of companies, I know some business owners who actually had to shut down their operation last year, but with mine, almost like yours, um, it was, it's actually been my best year. We've had the most new clients ever uh, since we started in 2017. And, you know, this year, like right now, like right before the show, I, I close another deal. It's like, oh my God, this is just amazing. <laughs> it's very similar, right? It's like how do you, you know, like the old style of like, especially like if you would have to like build business in Asia, right? It's like, okay, right. well, I guess I have to get on a plane and I have to do whatever. And it's like, well, no, you, you don't need to do that. I mean, you fundamentally, eventually we need to travel. Right. But 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 really, the world of business and trade has changed fundamentally forever. We still need to do it. And I hope at least by the fourth quarter we can do that. But we can do so much without Mm -hmm. doing a lot of that. And so so your business has has been changed dramatically and has improved. And certainly Global Chamber, you know, the vision, which never really was articulated around the pandemic, but articulated around how do we become a lot more efficient in our growth and the way we connect, that has helped. And and congratulations on your success in the same way. 
Absolutely. And likewise, uh, Doug. And so I, I could just imagine how 2021 will be for you, but tell me what's your projection and how you how do you envision 2021 for the for the global chamber? Oh, it we're I mean it's the first month has been, you know, another record, you know, and and we're internally just you know, the main conversations we have is how do we keep the customer service level improving? You know, how do we continue to add value and how do we add services? And there's so many ideas, you know, so we have all sorts of things that we're doing. One of them is, you know, incorporating artificial intelligence more directly into what we do. We already use artificial intelligence internally to connect people to each other, but now we want to continue to expand that and allow our members to tap into that directly rather than through headquarters. And so things like that, and certainly the, the events that we do, we started doing meetups where we, you can just kind of drop into Tokyo or into Dubai and meet up with our local people. That's been, you know, we never really envisioned that piece of it, but our Israel chapter started doing those weekly mm -hmm. and people were getting a lot of value out of it. So we started to spread that around the world. This morning, we did Israel-India meetups, so we're doing cross-metro meetups, and people are starting to connect up with each other. So those are some of the things that we see that are really driving value for our members. And so it'll be another record year, and we just need to keep innovating. We need to keep improving and building our team internationally. So we're, so that's uh, those are all good challenges and good good problems for sure. Well, see, I think I think that two major contributor of your success, uh, you know, from how I've known you for the last 15 years is you do very good in two things, particularly innovation and marketing. <laughs> yeah, it, it, if you look at your story, the, the Global Chamber story, it's what it is. You innovated and then you marketed because obviously you've got the global background already. And plus, like I said earlier, you're a super connector. So you already know a lot of people. And so yep. when you have those two combinations, it's obviously it's bound for success. And that is exactly what's happening right now, which is, man, I'm just super impressed with you, Doug. Well, one of the things that's so important in international business, as you know, I mean, it's important in business, period. But mm -hmm. you've got to be flexible and you've got to be resilient. Mm -hmm. You've got to you've got to look at what's happening. And yes, that's innovation. That's another way of saying innovation. Right. But but there's something deeper, right? You've got to be able to absorb what's happening. You've got to be able to, rather than like if things go wrong and things do go wrong, is to, to understand it, to, to, to analyze it, to not overanalyze, but to be able to look at it and say, well, what do people need? You know, is something changing and do I need to make a shift? And so having connections, having people, having a mind that, absorbs all of that and is flexible and is resilient. And then, yes, that means innovation. You've got to do that. And whether it's a U.S. business or especially international, stuff goes wrong. You've got to react. You've got to be able to live through that. And then to some extent, maybe almost relish it, right, is mm -hmm. to say, wow, you know, the world is amazing. The world has all this opportunity. And so how do I make the shifts? The problem then becomes prioritized. It's like right. there's a hundred opportunities you can go after tomorrow. My problem often is, you know, how do you narrow it down or how do you not get caught up in over analysis, which I'm an engineer originally, right? So, right? so sometimes I get caught in kind of spinning like, gee, maybe I need to think about that for a while. And, you know, it's so three months later, it's like I'm still thinking about it. So those are some of their challenges all of us have to face, right? And we all have our own uh, little demons and those are some of my own personal. So the key is surrounding yourself with people. And in my case, the just do it people is like, you know, enough of the analysis. Let's, mm -hmm. let's move it. This is a, this is a no brainer. Let's do this. And so, so surround you, surrounding yourself with people that are uh, balances with your own kind of foibles, if you will, is definitely a key to success as a, as an entrepreneur. Well, you know, Doug, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, for our listeners, this is yours in particular. It's a very inspiring story because, you know, for the sake of our listeners, you don't have to say your age, but for our listeners, Doug is not 20 years old. 
<laughs> uh, kind of going back to your the story of your grandfather. He started at 50. I don't think you're 50, Doug, but and you don't have to tell us your age, but tell us like more or less what's your age showing, just so people can realize that you can start business at any time. You don't have to be young to be a business owner or to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely old, older than 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 that, and and I, you're right. You can do it at any age, and it it kills me to see people not living a life that mm-hmm. they want. Right? Mm-hmm. That whether you know, and this conversation is why one of the reasons why women in global leadership and diversity in global leadership is so important. So many times people are held down by biases and expectations, and mm-hmm. you know that's wrong. People should be able to do whatever they really are inspired by. And the fact that I can do that means, you know, I'm a white guy. I'm, I've got a lot of white privilege that, is, that allows that. But a lot of people even now are not uh, necessarily allowed to do that. So I definitely say at any age. And going back to my grandfather, by the way, when he sold his business at age six. So he started at 50. He sold it at age 69. Hmm. And at age 69, as they were selling it, my grandmother started to think he was having an affair because <laughs> he would disappear during the day. Like, like, what's Joe doing? Like, so she ends up following him one day. So this is on Long Island. So he's driving out to Long Island and she's following him, like tailing him. Like, <laughs> like what in the world is he doing? So he ends up pulling into an airport. And he pulls next to a plane and he was taking pilot's license. He became the oldest pilot in New York State at age 69 to get a pilot's wow. license. But my grandmother pulls in behind him and she he turns around and sees her and is like, what in the world? Like, what are you doing? He goes, she starts hitting him, saying, Joe, Joe, I thought you were having an affair. This is much, much worse. <laughs> she was very concerned about his safety. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is that's why he was hiding it. He he was trying to keep it because she he knew that Emma, my (laughs) grandmother, would absolutely (laughs) think this was crazy that he was doing this at age 69. And but that's an entrepreneurial spirit, right? At any age, you should be able to do anything. He was taking uh, French lessons into his 80s. So (laughs) so if you're an entrepreneur, you're somebody very often that wants to continue to grow, continue to learn, and why not? You were we only live once. Let's have a, a good time of it. No, one hundred percent. And man, I Joel seems like a very interesting person. What an inspiration, right? So we are at the top of the hour. Um, I guess one last question for you, uh, Doug, is for those listening, and you've given some advice already. But what advice do you have for them? You know, especially with our environment today. Sure, we've got a new president. That's a pretty exciting part as well. But what do you have? What advice do you have for people who are just kind of on the edge? I'm thinking of setting up my own business, but I'm not really sure. Like, what, what advice do you have for them? So on, certainly on the international side, it, I, I'm the more optimistic than I ever uh, have been. I mean, the, the, with the new administration and the new worldview, and now that the world kind of realizes that the U.S. is back and <laughs> all of that craziness is, is over, I hope that certainly the re-engagement of America into the world is, you know, instead of a daily apology, it now becomes, hey, you know, we're back. We're normal and sane again, and let's do business. So that part of it creates all sorts of opportunity for American companies around the world. So if if you've got something that potentially has world uh, interest, this is a great time to do it. The world is is ready for you. The other piece I would say is, even though we talked about how being passionate and being, you know, seeing a vision and all of that, that's important and don't suppress that. But I would say have a mentor and have a, a, a circle of people around you that you can talk to. That if, if, if I had done more of that while I was kind of transitioning into this idea, we'd be, we would have made a lot more progress. And so I would say definitely talk have surround yourself with people that are talented, surround yourself with people you can kick ideas off of. And that's part of kind of the global tribe is people recognize you know, kind of what it takes. And so we do have a mentoring processes and we do want to have people connect up with each other and have that experience to be able to 
uh, tap in to people's experience and knowledge. Not that you have to listen to everything that they say. I mean, you should listen, but you don't have to agree or you know, follow what they say, but you should listen. You should under, ask questions and you should get advice. And that's a really critical thing as an entrepreneur is too many times I've seen people have a vision and it's like, oh, this is it. And they forget a lot of foundational things for the business to be successful. You definitely don't want to forget too much. You want to be able to not make too many mistakes. So of all of the entrepreneurial problems I've seen is, you know, make sure that you've got that underpinning and a, and a community of people that you can rely on. Legal, banking, marketing, sales, you know, a variety of different folks who can really help you get to the next level. Those are very practical not just high level advice, very practical advice. That, you know, I, I wish I had those advice as well when I was starting. But man, Doug, this has been a blessing to have you in the show. I, this concludes our show today. But Doug, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And for those who are listening, oh, actually, let me ask you this. I'm sure there are people who want to get in touch with you uh, and learn more about the Global Chamber. What's the best way to learn more about them and get in touch with you, Doug? I appreciate that, Chris. And congratulations on your continued success. Love Thank working you. with you. You're in a, love the love the program as well. Uh, with Global Thank Chamber, you. we're at uh, globalchamber.org. Dot .org so come on uh, and just kind of check it out and send a, a message through the contact or email me directly at doug at globalchamber.org so pretty just as it sounds d o u g at globalchamber.org and just you know tell me what your issues are and what you're what you're wrestling with and we'll be happy to provide you know free help and support in terms of like getting you in the in the right direction. Some folks are early, early stage, and there are plenty of early stage resources that are available, you know, to tap into. You, before you jump globally, you want to be able to have the basics set, and there's a lot of resources out there, and we can direct you there. And then when you're ready, you've got kind of the foundation built, jump into Global Chamber. We'll be happy to help and work with you. And the tribe is amazing. What mm. makes us great is not just the vision, which is fine, mm. but the tribe. Yeah. Like you, Chris. Like I, I you agree. Know, amazing people. At ev with every resource, they're just extraordinary. And I just thank my lucky stars that, you know, there's, there's folks that have that talent, that professionalism, that high ethics, the honesty, there's so much that they're able to accomplish. And I'm just so happy and proud that they're part of the tribe. And so feel free uh, to, to connect in that way. And we'll happy to connect you too. And, and guys, I've been part of the Global Chamber almost since it's it started. Uh, and I've been a consistent member in the last few years. And I can truly attest to that. I think the biggest differentiator of this group is just the people. Uh, amazing people. And obviously, that's a reflection of the leader, Doug, that's you. And again, Doug, with 15 years, 15 years of friendship, we've known each other. I've introduced you to a lot of your contacts and I've done the same. And it just has been an absolute blessing. So, Doug, again, thanks, thanks so much for spending time with us in this show. Um, I hope the listeners enjoyed and please do reach out uh, to Doug again. Doug can be reached at, you know, through their website, globalchamber.org. Again, guys, this show has been brought to you by Gapta Global, your outsourcing company for recruitment, virtual assistance, and virtual and various back office services. You can learn more about their services at gaptaglobal.com. This has been your host, Chris Yap, of the podcast show From Zero to Revenue. As Stephen Covey said, all things are created twice, first in the mind, than in reality. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of From Zero to Revenue with your host, Chris Yap. If you've enjoyed the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and review on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.